open our Bibles to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3. And we've been talking about the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And chapters 1 and 2 really give us the information of how Jesus is so much greater than anyone and everything. And then we get into chapter number 3 and see how that because of His supremacy, you and I are responsible to live a certain way, and we talked about those things that we need to put to death in our lives, and then a couple of weeks ago, our last time we studied this together, we looked at these 13 things that you and I are to make a part of our lives because Jesus Christ is supreme. And uh, if Jesus Christ is first place in our hearts and our lives, then we will put on all these things, as it talked about in verse number 12 of chapter number 3, the bowels of mercy, of kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing and forgiving one another, charity and peace and all these different things. The Word of God and worship will be a part of our lives and we get down to verse number 17. It says, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do, what's the next word? All. All in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So, I would say that's pretty inclusive as far as what we're supposed to do in the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we get down and... We're going to look beginning in verse number 18 tonight. If uh, we had a title for this message, we might entitle it Roll Call. Looking at the roles that we have in home and society. Verse 18 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is, the, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ." But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. And in chapter 4, verse number 1 says, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. So, as we look at this portion of Scripture, end of chapter 3 and beginning of chapter number 4, I'm, you know, sometimes we have these divisions that are, are man-made divisions, chapters and verses. They, they were not in the original letters that were written down. It baffles me how it got divided this way, but uh, we're going to look at these different roles that each of us have. We all have different roles in life. You have a role in your home, whether husband, wife, child. Uh, we have roles in society, whether you're a boss or you're in, in employee, you work for somebody, we have different things, we get more specific as far as, um, you know, being a pastor and a husband, and, and my, uh, my pastor in Alabama, uh, Pastor Eddie Wallace, used to like to talk about all the different hats he had to wear as a person, and, uh, you know, take this hat off, and you have to put this hat on, and you got this role and this different responsibility, and... When we think about the different roles that each of us have, this portion of Scripture says, hey, based upon the information that we've given you about the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I are to fulfill our roles in a certain way. I think verse number 23 sums it up very well when it says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Uh, we looked at verse number 17 just a second ago. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So some might say, well, verse number 23 is very specifically in context referencing verse number 22 as far as servants go, so we don't really have to do the others as unto the Lord. But verse 17 comes before verse 18. It says, 
whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So whatever the role I have in life, whether in home or society, in church, I'm going to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to do it for Him, for His honor and for His glory. Let's have a word of prayer as we look at these different roles and how we are to fulfill them. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your goodness, Your mercy. We praise You that You are the all-powerful Creator God, the sustainer and giver of life. Lord, we do pray that you would help us as we think about our lives. We all have a lot of different roles and responsibilities. And Lord, many of them are tough, they're stressful, it's very complicated and hard to accomplish these things. And really, in our flesh, it is impossible. But we're thankful that you do not expect us to fulfill these things in our flesh but by the Spirit. And so, Lord, we ask now that the Spirit of God would come and would work in our hearts. Lord, if there's an area where we are lacking in one of these roles, I pray that you would convict us. And Lord, may we make a new commitment to fulfill the roles that you have given to us for your honor and for your glory. God, I pray that we would live our lives to do things your way. For your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to look at these six different roles that are listed for us here and talk about how we are to fulfill them. And uh, verse number 18, it's, it's not going to be difficult for you to follow along the points and what we're going to look at. The first point has to do with wives, and wives fulfill their role through submission. And this is not a popular topic today in our society, but it's what God has ordained. So let's take a look and see what he says. In verse 18, says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, that word submit, which has almost become like a curse word today in our society, means to willingly place yourself under the authority of another. And Jesus submitted to his authority. Uh, we find that all of us are to be in submission one to another. In other words, if there is whatever the authority is, I am to submit to it. And we all have authority in our lives. No matter how powerful we are, we have authorities that we have to submit to. You go to the highest office in the land, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, has authorities that he is to submit to. Now, we all have that choice of whether or not we're going to submit to that authority. But God has commanded and ordained that we all submit to our authority. So, it's not, not a bad thing. To live a life of submission. In fact, it's one as Christians that we are called to. Now, you'll notice what it says. And a lot of what we're going to cover, the Apostle Paul wrote almost the exact thing to the Ephesians. Ephesians 5 and 6 cover a lot of these things. In some places in Ephesians chapter number 6 goes into a little bit more detail. Uh, but Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So almost exactly the same wording is given. And you'll notice in both of those accounts, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. So wives are not commanded and women are not commanded to submit to all men. It doesn't say that. So my wife, Lysandra, has been commanded by God to submit to me as her husband, not to Pastor Plinus or to anyone else. Okay, so if somebody else starts telling my wife what to do, we're, we're going to have some problems very quickly. Because it doesn't say all women submit to all men. It doesn't say wives submit to all men, and, and sometimes... 
people take certain things out of context and they use it for abuse and then what we want to do is we want to run the opposite direction because we're so afraid of being associated with this over here. So we, God has ordained and designed the home and how it ought to operate. God has ordained and designed government. He's ordained and designed church, how these different things are to be organized and operate, and He knows best how they should work. And so it's not that men are better than women. They're not. Men and women were both created in the image of God, and they have equal value, equal importance. Just because they have different roles doesn't mean that one is better than the other, or one is less than the other. I think of the Godhead. Think about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is how we choose to describe them and are often portrayed in the Scripture. Three persons in one. I don't necessarily understand how all that works, and I don't need to. I don't want a God that I can completely figure out and understand. Uh, three persons in one. Now, they all have different roles. Does that mean one is more important than the other? Does it mean God the Father is more important than the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit is more important than Jesus? Now, some places treat it that way, and they neglect one person or the other, and that's, that's a dangerous thing to do, and you border on the edge of blasphemy when you talk about one being more important than the other. Not more important. Different roles. Same level of value and importance. And I hope that will help you to understand the relationship between husband and wife as well. Women are not inferior to men in any capacity. They were designed differently. And I'm thankful for that. And you ought to be thankful for that. I wish that our society would understand that just because we're designed differently doesn't mean one is more important than the other. doesn't mean we're saying one is less than the other. Man, this whole thing with the Boy Scouts has my blood boiling. It's ridiculous. It's crazy what's going on in our world today. Um, you know, the, the Bible talks about giving honor unto the wife as a weaker vessel. Not, not in the, the sense that less value, but something that's very important and fragile. We take some of the most important and valuable things in our society and in the world are they're very fragile and you want to treat them very carefully why because they have value they have importance and so we want to we want you I do want you to understand that when we talk about submission I'm not going to ignore submission just because it gets some people upset but I also want you don't want you to misunderstand what submission is about and so marriage, as the scripture tells us, is a picture of Christ's relationship with the church. Ephesians 5, 23 and 24 says, For the husband is the head of, of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So he designed the home to work in, in such a way, and he has established the husband is the head or the leader of the home. Doesn't mean he's the dictator. Doesn't mean that just you have to, ever, whatever he wants happens, not the king of the castle. It's not what it's talking about. We'll get to husbands in just a second. But there's a leader, and then you have a supporter. And how important that that is. God designed it to work in a certain way. And he tells wives, hey, you need to submit in the name of, of the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus is supreme, he says this is the way you are to fulfill your role in the home as a wife. Then we get to husbands, secondly, in verse number 19, husbands fulfill their role through love. Notice what it says. It says, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And so the role, the way the husband's role is fulfilled is through loving his wife. And I like this portion of Scripture in Ephesians 5 because it explains in a lot more detail the type of love 
that uh, he's talking about. Now, we can just take the word love and it, we ought to understand what that means. But unfortunately, we, our, our word for love is so polluted and tainted. We, we talk about loving this thing and that thing and the other thing and it doesn't mean a lot anymore. But he describes the type of love that he's talking about in Ephesians chapter number 5. It says, husbands, love your wives, verse number 25, even as Christ also loved the church. Because remember, it's a, it's a picture of Christ's relationship with the church, marriages. So love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And he explains the type of love that he's talking about and gave himself for it. It's a sacrificial love. He says that so ought men ought to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth even as the Lord, the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So he says, husbands, we have a responsibility to love our wives. That's how our role is fulfilled in the home. And uh, I want to give you five ways how you can Love your wife the proper way. First of all, spend time with her. You ought to spend time with her. You ought to love to spend time with her. I feel sorry for a husband and a wife that do not enjoy spending time together. There's something wrong. We ought to, you ought to be married to your best friend. I hope that you can say that. You ought to make her a priority to spend time with her. And man, so many... Husbands, they got all kinds of priorities for this hobby and that thing and for work and for this and all this stuff. When the most important thing is back at the house. Make her a priority. Spend time with her. Fancy gifts and whatever else are meaningless if you don't spend time with her. It's not going to make up for the lost time. You go and spend all day out doing this and that and you leave no time for her, but you want to come home with whatever, and I don't care what it is, diamond bracelet or whatever, it's not going to be as important to her as you showing her that she's important to you by spending time with her. We make time for what's important to us. Show your wife that she's important by spending time with her. Secondly, listen to her. Listen to her. Your wife wants to pour out her heart to you. She wants you to hear her and to understand. So put the phone down, turn, have a time where the TV's off and everything else. You know, make a certain time. If this is my time. You have all my focus. I want to know how your day is. I want to know what happened. I want to know how it made you feel. Feelings are important to the ladies and guys if you haven't figured that out yet. Looking at the ages in here, most of us should have figured that out by now. If you haven't, I want to fill you in. Feelings are important to your wife. And they have feelings about everything. Absolutely everything stirs up some sort of feeling in them, and they want to share it with you. They want to tell you about everything and how it made them feel. So have a time where you set certain things aside. And honey, right now, I just I want to hear about you. I want to know how you're feeling. I want to know what you're thinking. I want to know what's going on in your life. My wife and I, we've got a certain understanding. There's certain times she doesn't come and tell me things important. You know, this time of year, she's got all my attention. Soak it up. Hawkeyes don't play football until September. So <laughs> you've got this year and this one right now. But when, when, like, when Hawkeye football's on, that's not a time where my wife's going to come and tell me something. She's, she, she learned that very early on. She'd come and tell me something important. I would not hear it. Why? Because my focus and attention is somewhere else. And then there'd be some sort of miscommunication, and she was upset. Why? Because she didn't have my full attention at that time. I was giving my attention to something else. There needs to be a time where all that's off. Put the phone away on silent. If you have to, power it off. Put it in another room. And just my attention, my time's right here. Because I want to hear you. Not only should we listen to her, we need to talk to her. And this one is a lot harder for us guys, maybe, than even listening is. This comes because she doesn't want to just share her feelings. 
She wants you to share your feelings. She wants to know what you're thinking about certain things. She wants to know how things make you feel. That's, that can be tough for us to learn. But it's necessary if you're going to have the relationship that you're supposed to have. And it shows her that you love her. When you're willing to open yourself up and be vulnerable, and you ought to be able to do that with your spouse. It tells her a lot. It tells her you love her when you pour out your heart and your feelings about everything that's going on. So you need to talk to her. Tell her what's going on. Fourthly, pray with her. You ought to spend time praying with your wife. You ought to have a regular time. I'm not saying necessarily every day, because sometimes those things don't work, work schedules and everything else, but at least every week you ought to have the time where you get together and spend time in prayer. There's something about praying with somebody that just unites hearts together. I mean, when you're, you hear somebody pour out their soul to God, you hear what's important to them, you hear what's valuable, you understand what they're feeling. And man, when your wife hears you pray for her, for the family, for church, for the community, for souls and whatever else, as you both draw closer to God, it, it draws you closer to one another as well. Show your love by praying with her and then... Fifthly, we could, we could have a list go on for a long time. Lead her. Lead her. You have been created to be the leader of your home, and a wife craves that. Your wife, whether she says it or not, wants you to be the leader of your home. She wants you to fulfill your God-given role and responsibility. And so you ought to, you ought to lead spiritually. Okay, your wife should not be the one saying it's time to go to church or we need to go to church. She's not the one that should be saying, hey, we need to be witnessing to our neighbor, to a family member, to whatever else. She's not the one that should say, hey, man, it's been a while. Maybe we should read the Bible together. That's, that's our responsibility as the husband, as the head of my home. I am the one. You are the one who is to lead her. And when I step forth and lead like I'm supposed to, it shows my love for her. So just a couple ideas, gentlemen, as uh, how you can love your wife better. When and it's amazing how God designed the marriage relationship and the home to work because when husbands love their wives correctly, it is easier for wives to submit correctly. So as I love like I'm supposed to, it's easier for my wife to fulfill her God-given role. And as she fulfills her God-given role, it makes it that much easier for me to love her the way that I'm supposed to. And it just it's a cycle that as each of us fulfill our role, it's that much easier for the other one to fulfill their role. Thirdly, children fulfill their role through obedience. Through obedience. Verse number 20 says, Children... Obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Now, notice what it says. It says, children, you are to obey in all things. It doesn't say when I understand. It doesn't say when I think it's fair. It says, children, obey in all things. Think of Ephesians 6, 1, and 3, 1 through 3. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, so far the verses is speaking of children. It, it covers just those, there's a certain timeline. So I move out of my parents' house. I don't obey my mother and father in all things anymore. And I mentioned this, I mentioned this not long ago. My mom doesn't tell me what time to go to bed anymore. That would be weird. <laughs> if she drove by, saw my light on up in my bedroom, and it's time for you to turn that light off and go to bed. Like, like what? Have you, mom, is it time to put you in a home? Like, you lost your mind? What's going on here? There's a timeline on some things as far as obedience is concerned. So once I move out, I establish my own home, then we, we 
we leave and cleave, as the scripture tells us. We establish our own family and, and rules and so on and so forth. So this section speaks to those children who are under the authority of their parents. You are to obey in all things. It's the right thing to do. You obey your parents just as you are obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you may not like what your parents have to say. That doesn't matter. God has put you in their home under their authority. You are to obey. You may not understand. It doesn't matter. Our parents understand a lot of things that we don't. They've seen a lot of things that we haven't seen. They've experienced things that they don't want us to experience, and that's why there's certain rules and, and all this stuff. You don't need to understand, and Jesus never said, obey if you understand. He said, obey in all things, because it's the right thing to do. And then, in Ephesians, we get to the portion that there, there is no stopping point of. It's the rest of our lives. Ephesians 6, 2, and 3 says, honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. So, I am to honor my father and mother till the day I die. The natural order of things is that parents go before children, and there are occurrences where that doesn't take place, and that's a very difficult thing for a parent to go through, I imagine. For the most part, I'm going to live longer than my parents. You're going to live longer than your parents. As long as you're living, you are to honor your father and your mother. It doesn't say honor them if they're great people. Honor them if they did everything right. That's not what it says. It just flat out says you honor your father and your mother. Give them the respect that they deserve. And, uh, you know, as, as parents move up older in age, they need more help, they need more care. And we show honor to them by making sure they have what they need, making sure they're taken care of. And then we can honor their memory, their reputation by what we do and what we say. And so children fulfill their role through obedience. And we, we covered discipline this morning in our parental guidance series, so I won't, I won't go back over all that. I did want to share uh, three things very quickly on this matter of obedience before we move on. Uh, first of all, do what you are told, as far as obedience is concerned. Do what you're told. Secondly, do it immediately. Thirdly, do it with a good attitude. Those are hard things to do. That's a full-time job right there. That's your job as a child under your parents' authority. And it's a tough job to do. I remember there was a lot of times that I disobeyed all three. I didn't do it. I didn't do it right away, and I didn't do it with a good attitude. It's tough. It's hard. But it's the right thing to do. Obey your parents as under Christ. Next has to do with parents. Fourthly, parents fulfill their role uh, and I have it written down here, it's through balance, through balance. I've got it typed wrong in my notes. I had to think about what I said. Through balance, I almost went like, what did I type? There it is, good. See, that's why you do that, in case your notes are wrong here. We need balance as parents. Look at what it says in verse number 21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. We spent a little bit of time looking at this verse and others associated with it this morning. The word provoke is the idea to stir up or excite. So you shouldn't stir up anger in your children's lives for the wrong reasons. Sometimes kids get upset just because you tell them certain rules and things. That's not what it's talking about. So kids don't go back home and say, don't stir up anger in me by giving me a curfew or telling me to do chores or whatever else. No, it's, it's, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about by not having balance. Turn over to Ephesians chapter number 6. When we get out of balance, we stir up an improper anger in our children. So if we have too much discipline, like we talked this morning, it's just all discipline all the time. No, that's not the right thing. If we're way to the other side, there's no discipline. That's, a, that's an improper imbalance. 
that causes problems. If it's all affirmation, all we do is tell our kids all the time how great they are and how wonderful and how special. And No, listen, sometimes our kids are just average. I, I, get, I think it's hilarious sometimes how, you know, some kids will make this drawing or this coloring or whatever, and it's like the greatest thing in the entire... No, it's not. It's a scribble paper. Like, let's call it what it is. Yes, you attempted very well, but it's average. It's okay to have average things. Our, I, I, I know that goes against society and people don't like it. That's fine. You're the, they give out participation awards. You know, that's another thing I can go on about. But all affirmation, it, it's not right. It's not right. Okay? So we need to have balance in everything. Ephesians 6, 4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. It's almost the same exact thing that he said in Colossians. A little different at the end, though. Look at this. It says, but bring them up in the, what's the word? Okay, so nurture first. And what? Admonition of the Lord. So he tells us we're to bring them up in two things. So there's to be balance here. He says, first of all, nurture. Now, nurture is the positive thing. So that's the good things, that's the encouragement, that's the building up, that's the affirmation. Yeah, you did a good job, I'm proud of you, you were responsible, you were obedient, whatever it is. And we ought to, on a regular basis, praise our children when they do good, when they do what's right, when they obey. The only time they should hear from us should not be when they do wrong. And sadly, in a lot of homes, the only time kids hear from their parents is when they misbehave when they fail a test that's not the right thing to do we need to have balance he says bring them up first of all in the nurture in man rewards and praise to me go a lot further than discipline ever does it's a it is a motivator i mean you have a positive thing that if you do well this is what you achieve that's, that's a big motivator. But we need to have balance. It's not just that. He says nurture and admonition, which has the idea of correction, the discipline that we talked about this morning. So we need to have the balance, praise and correction, and parents fulfill their role through balance. Workers fulfill their role through excellence. Verse 22 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Now knowing that, notice the sentence doesn't stop there. Verse 23 and 24 are included in the sentence. Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of person. So these verses here are all in context with verse number 22, that first word, servants. Now he's referring to in context to slaves. And we'll take that in the realm of workers. Um, now he's not condoning slavery here. So I want to make that very clear. Nowhere in Scripture does it condone slavery. But he, he says, hey, workers, and, and we may feel like a slave to our employer. He says, servants, you are to obey your masters like you're serving God himself. I find that fascinating. You know, in the context of the day and the time, these people did not have a choice on if they served or not. And there were high repercussions for disobedience. But he says, hey, you are to serve like you're serving God himself. And so when that, we, we translate that to us in the workplace, you are to serve in your workplace like you're serving God himself. Not just when the manager's watching or your boss is walking, watching, your superior, whatever else. And we all know people like that. We've all worked with people like that. And we hate people like that. Because, man, they look like the greatest worker in the world as long as their manager's watching. But as soon as he steps out of the room, 
In fact, it's loving all. That's not as a Christian, that's not a way you and I are to live our lives. Jesus is absolutely supreme. He says, in word or deed, do in the name of Jesus. And so, whether you're an engineer or whether you change baby diapers, do all of it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, listen, even if you're not rewarded here, because these slaves were not rewarded for their obedience in this life, he says, God sees it. And he says... Verse 24, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. He says, hey, God sees everything that you do. This is in the area of workplace. Maybe we haven't thought about that much as Christians. God sees what you're doing. And you're going to either get a reward, or you're going to get a correction based upon how you behave in the workplace and how you perform for your employer. He says you do well, God will reward you. If you do wrong, verse 25, you're going to receive for the wrong that you have done. And Ephesians 6, 5 through 8 talks more about this as far as the servants were concerned But you notice the law of reaping and sowing even in the workplace. You reap what you sow. You do well, you're going to receive the reward. You do wrong, you're going to receive for the wrong. And it says there is no respect of persons. doesn't matter who you are. And then this wonderful chapter division that we have. We'll look at one verse here. Colossians 4 verse number 1 says, Bosses fulfill their role through justice. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. And so bosses fulfill that role through justice. Ephesians 6, 9 says, And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. And one of the things that he tells bosses here is to remember... You have a master. Now, our master, if we know Jesus, he says is in heaven. Some of us on this earth, we we have a boss that we answer to day in, day out, week in, week out, and we have to obey and perform. Some of us in here, we are the boss. We're the one who calls the shots and have people working under us, and we have to lead and take care of them. And for those bosses, he says, you need to be just. You need to be fair with everybody who works under you. Everybody who's under your authority. Because we have a master in heaven and he is our ultimate example. And in Ephesians 6 verse number 9, in talking about the master in heaven, he says he does not respect persons. In other words, he doesn't show favoritism. It doesn't matter skin color, it doesn't matter what sex you are, it doesn't matter how rich or poor, education or anything, God is not a respecter of persons in any way, shape, or form. Salvation's open and available to all. Blessings open and available to all. He he deals with people all the same. How we choose to deal with Him, that's up to us, and then He'll deal with us accordingly. But he's not a respecter of persons. And if we are in a place of authority, we should not be a respecter of persons either. So just because we get along with somebody better than another person doesn't mean we should treat that person better than someone else in the workplace. It's not right. It's not just and fair. So bosses fulfill their role through justice. So as we go down through these six roles, and we could probably break it up into some others even, Where are you at here? So all of us are going to fall into different roles and different responsibilities. For most of us in here, we are either a child, a parent, husband, a wife. Uh, We work somewhere or we, we lead some people. We have different roles, multiples. How are we doing on fulfilling those roles? Are we wearing that hat, as Pastor Wallace used to say, and fulfilling that role like we're doing it for the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it all about me? 
my own flesh, my own desires. Jesus Christ is supreme. Now fulfill your role like he is supreme. Fulfill your role like he is everything. Knowing good or bad, we're going to receive the reward. 